Daniel Crosslink, welcome back to my final review of the Ethelson Q5, one of the most affordable Delta printers on the market in 2021. This device was given to me by Ethelson for free, but as every time on this channel, this is a completely independent review with all the good, the bad, and the ugly details. I put a lot of time into test prints around 142 hours actually to get really into all the depth required to make this review, so stick around for those results. Let's start with how easy it is to get started with this printer. The build was super quick, around 30 minutes to get the frame assembled and connecting all the cables. Everything is labeled so you can't make any mistakes and the plugs are colored so you will know easily which ones belong together. Another good thing, there is only one type of screw on this whole frame assembly, so no searching for the right screw in multiple bags like with other printers and also no searching for the right hex driver. This is just a detail, but it makes assembly so much easier and faster. The manual is short, but quite understandable. Actually, I did miss the fact that the full guide is actually on the SD card. So sorry for not finding that in the build video. By the way, if you're interested to see more of the build process, I've linked my build video up here in the corner. There's more details about how the build worked for me and how I got my first test prints done. And once the frame was assembled, I realized it's quite sturdy, but it's also quite top heavy because everything, electronics, motors, and power supply are in this top compartment. And if you put a one kilogram spool on the holder, it's even more top heavy. By the way, this spool holder is really tiny. It won't hold any of the wider spools, like for example, the Amazon basic spool. That's a bummer. So you should print a larger one using this printer, of course. Surprisingly, being top heavy, this didn't cause any issues in the overall results. But if you use the touch screen, and we'll talk about that later, it starts wobbling a bit. And this cannot be fixed by tightening the screws even further, so better don't push it once you're printing. This might cause quality issues, especially in higher parts otherwise. Another thing with having everything in this top compartment is that the power cable and the cables going down to the heated bed are dangling around a bit, but that's how it is. You either like it or not. A last thing that might have to do with the frame, once you've done the set leveling using the probe, you should keep the printer set in its place. I've noticed that I had to redo the set calibration when I started moving the printer around, for example, because I wanted another camera angle or I moved it from the studio to the lab and back. Just to give you an idea, I did the same with the Ender 3 V2 and I never had to do a new bed leveling, so it seems that this printer is a bit more sensitive in that regard. Next, let's talk about the print bed and the usable print volume. The heated bed has a glass surface that's coated with ceramic and that helps a lot to make things stick really well to the surface while printing. Sometimes prints actually stick a little too well to the surface, but who would actually complain about that? So PLA sticks really well between 50 and 60 degrees Celsius surface temperature and the surface can be heated up to 110 degrees Celsius. This would make it suitable for printing ABS, but you would probably have have to build some kind of enclosure to keep the temperature up because ABS will otherwise warp and probably release from the build plate. As with every glass plate, it requires cleaning from time to time with isopropanol alcohol, even though it might look clean, but there is going to be a very thin layer of dirt collecting over time. The build plate itself is circular and has a diameter of 200 millimeter, but this also limits you to 140 by 140 millimeters for rectangular parts. The maximum print height is supposed to be 200 millimeter, but it's rather 190 millimeters in the upper corners because of the kinematics of this Delta system, but you will see this in the test prints. The filament system is a Bowden style with a Titan clone extruder, which works fine with PLA, PETG, maybe some stiffer TPU and also ABS. So I got significant under extrusion in some of the test prints. So I've checked the E-steps calibration using the method I describe in detail. 
in the video linked up here in the corner. The results show that e-steps were too low by about 10%, so this is definitely an issue that you should tackle to improve print quality. Keep in mind, with everything that you are about to see, I did not do the e-step calibration before my test prints because I wanted to see all the issues before changing anything to be fair. Getting down the first layer with this printer requires you to run the bed leveling process. I've shown that also in my build video. It's easy to do and the calibration is quite consistent unless you start moving around the printer. As I mentioned before, in the first test print, I had to tune the final nozzle distance a bit, not to squish the filament too much, but I got really nice results right from the start. The electronics are all packed into this upper compartment. If we look inside, we see all the components are nicely accessible, wired up neatly, and I had zero issues with the electronics during my test prints, so nothing failed. The mainboard model is a 32-bit MKS Robin Nano 1.2 with a 2.5-inch color touch screen. The good thing about this mainboard is that you could swap out the stepper drivers if any of them would be defective at any point in time. It seems that we have TMC 2208 silent drivers for the movement motors and for the extruder. Strangely, they chose to use an A4899, so this makes the extruder motor noticeably louder than the other motors. On this mainboard, you could install Marlin firmware or Clipper. There's already people out there who've done and documented this, which I like a lot for a few Future tinkering. The mainboard has some additional upgrade ports as well, like two filament sensor ports, a second extruder driver slot, so you could upgrade this printer to dual color printing, which sounds awesome. And there is a port for a power loss detection module and another port for a Wi-Fi extension module. So plenty of upgrades possibilities for the future. The power supply seems to be of good quality and it's 24 watt. <laughs> Talking about the display that is connected to this mainboard, it's quite small, but it does the job. It reacts quickly to touches and the icon and font sizes are probably okay for most people. The menu system is easy to understand, symbols are clear and mostly intuitive. It's quite prone to collect fingerprints though. Being at the top of the printer frame with this top heavy design, touching the screen always induces some shakiness into the frame, however. The firmware that runs on the printer is not open source, but at least you can configure a bunch of settings using a configuration file that you can edit and put on the SD card to change things like extruder and access calibration, acceleration, jerk, and more stuff. This would be useful to improve print quality and probably will at some point make you want to install Marlin or Clipper to get more control. <laughs> The noise levels on this printers are quite good, except the one fan here at the hot end that is running all the time. If you would exchange that one for a high quality fan, it would be actually quite acceptable to run this printer in an office. The printer supports print resuming. So if you lose power, it will offer you to continue when power is back. And it also has thermal runaway protection enabled. Unfortunately, there is no filament sensor coming with the device by default, but you can add it quite easily by printing one yourself and using a simple lever switch connected to the filament detection port on the main board. <laughs> Let's talk about print quality. In general, the print quality for all these things is quite good. It's not astonishing good. However, we'll look at different prints that I've done in the last weeks now to check whether there is issues or not. If you missed my time lapses video containing all these test prints, go watch that video also. It's just beautiful to see these prints coming to life. Let's start with the test elephant from the build video. It's really very good quality. All the corners and roundings of this part are without any issues. I don't see anything in terms of stringing or ringing, and it has also been printed at 40 millimeters per second. The next one is the battery storage box printed in PETG. Surprisingly, printing PETG did not require any tuning of my settings. I just started printing this with my default PETG profile in Cura, and it did come out quite nicely. Just a few stringing issues here in the inner part of the battery slots, but that is quite normal for PTG and can be quickly fixed using a heat 
Bitcoin. The Money Clip wallet was the first one where I saw issues with under extrusion and besides the fact that the e-steps were calibrated too low, as I mentioned before, the under extrusion also was worse for faster prints than with slower prints. The book stand, on the other hand, turned out really well. No signs of under extrusion here, although it was printed at 60 mm per second, so it might also have to do with the material. Another issue with this print, it is designed for a printer that has a 200 by 200 mm print area, so I had to downscale it a little bit to fit on this printer. You will find this becoming an issue with quite a few free designs because 200 by 200 is basically the market standard for minimum X and Y area, and you will have to downsize a lot of the stuff for this printer. The Black Panther turned out really nice and shiny, no issues here. Now about the Voronoi dining lamp. This one is a bit trickier. It's printed at 60 millimeter per second in PLA and there's a few issues. First, there's all kinds of under extrusion here in the middle of the print. Still, the structure looks really nice. Here at the top, we see another problem where it seems like the nozzle detached from the printed part and printed in the air for the last few layers. And that's actually what happened because this part is designed to be exactly 200 millimeter high and 180 millimeter wide. And I mentioned in the beginning that at the topmost region of the print area, printing in the edges is only possible up until about 190 millimeter of height. Anything above that will have to be more in the middle of the print area, otherwise you will see this kind of effect. The shelf holder set I printed in the same material as the money clip wallet, but at lower speed, at 40 millimeter per second, and it turned out really nice and without any visual issues. So under extrusion is a little more under control at lower speeds, it seems. The exponent box, also printed at 40 millimeter per second, turned out perfectly and with a really shiny, even surface. Also the mechanics move freely, so precision seems not to be an issue with this part. Although people claim that Delta printers in general have issues with printing precision parts, I don't see this happening here. In general, I can say that there is light and shadow with these results. Print speed should be around 40 millimeters per second for really good results. You might go higher, but this will induce some issues as you've seen. Another problem that is caused by the mainboard, most probably by the firmware, and maybe also by the fact that the CPU on the mainboard isn't the fastest, is if you use the menu while printing, the printer will show stuttering. It might even stop for a moment to render the display. And that shows me that this mainboard is really at the edge of its capabilities to run this printer. So probably another firmware might help here or changing the mainboard for a faster one like the SKR Turbo or the Do It 3 maybe. Let's see how print speed really influences quality and how fast this printer is printing compared to the Ender 3 V2 for the same part at the same speeds. I've printed several Banshees. To keep it short, printing the Banshee with the factory settings at 40 mm per second takes 1 hour 28 minutes and on the Ender 3 V2 it takes 2 hours 21 minutes. So this shows printing is faster with a Delta printer and even if you set the print speed to 90 millimeters on the Ender 3 V2, the Banshee still takes 1 hour 38 minutes, whereas the Q5 will go down to about 1 hour and 6 minutes and this is with default settings on both printers. Print quality of course is affected by higher speeds. These are the side-by-side -side Banshee comparisons. At 40 millimeter per second, at 60 millimeter per second, and at 90 millimeter per second. And you can clearly see that the Ender 3 V2 visually looks a lot cleaner at every speed, whereas the Q5 even at the lower speed never reaches the same level of quality. You can tweak the Q5 to print even faster by setting the acceleration value in the firmware to something like 5000 mm per second squared, and this will make prints even faster, but also degrade quality a bit, especially at higher speeds. So my sweet spot will be using the higher acceleration of 5000 mm per second squared at 40 mm per second print speed, which results in this Banshee being printed in 1 hour 24 minutes. 
My final thoughts on this printer. It's a really good printer for the price, no doubts about it. If you're a beginner, you'll be happy with the quality and how easy it is to get started and get prints done. And it's really fast. Some people are really most frustrated that 3D printing is so slow, and this could be one good reason to get this printer. Of course, unless you don't need a bigger print volume. If you need more volume and also better overall print quality, look for printers like the Ender 3 v 2 The basic frame probably can be a good base for upgrading it later to a more capable mainboard like the Duet Wi-Fi or any board that has more compute power. It also has lots of potential for future upgrades, like dual color printing, and filament sensors. So get this printer if you're tired of waiting for prints, if you don't need the best print quality out there, and if you're on a budget. Notification squad, you are lucky because I'm giving away this printer. So in the first 48 hours of this video going live, leave a comment on this video as every time don't forget to mention your country because we unfortunately cannot ship to every country in the world and tell me why you want this printer. By the way, I've put a link in the description box to purchase this printer. If you use this link, it's gonna help me make more of these videos. If you like this video, probably you might wanna watch one of the other two I've linked up here for you. And I see you in the next one. Bye.